Bible, I'd like for you to turn to two passages of scripture today. I'd like for you to turn to Genesis chapter one. And then once you find your place there, if you'll turn over to Exodus chapter three, we're starting a brand new series of messages today entitled fine wine. This is all about how to make wine. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) This is actually a relationship series because good relationships take time. My, my marriage is more like fine wine today because of the years that we have spent making sure, putting the right ingredients, making sure the right things are in it. And I want your relationships to be like fine wine. Uh, you know, listen, if, if you say, well, we're going we're gonna to take a year and we're going to age it in a year and we're going to see what we got. Probably not going to be fine wine. I mean, that's, uh, you know, what do, you, what do they call it? Boone's Farm? Is that what that is? So <clears throat> I'm shocked that you people don't even know what that is. Just my wife won't know what Boone's Farm is. So anyway, but listen, I'm just telling you good relationships take time. Um, let, me, let me just say something real quick. Talk about your relationship with the Lord. My relationship with the Lord is better and deeper and stronger than it has ever been, but it's taken time to get there. You don't just, you don't walk into a relationship with Jesus and all of a sudden you're super Christian. And I don't know if any of us will ever get to the super Christian position, but I will tell you my, my relationship with the Lord is stronger and deeper and more powerful. I feel more humbled being near him now because of time. Time makes you grow closer to someone. So fine wine. And by the way, let me just say to you so that you understand, why is this so important? Because I do believe we live in the last days. And I want to help you to understand that before we get into the message, okay? I want you to understand we live in the last days. Someone says, how do you know? Okay, watch this. Uh, And I didn't have you turn here, but you're welcome to. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says, but as for you, Daniel, he, he told Daniel, write all these things down. Make sure you put them out there. And then he says, but as for you, Daniel, conceal these words Seal up the book until the end of time. And here's what he's trying to say, that at the end of time, the book will be revealed. It will be unveiled. All, most all of Daniel, about half of Daniel is all about prophetic things that are going to happen uh, when the second coming happens. So listen, there's a first coming. That's when Messiah came, died for men's sins, uh, rose again from the dead, and ascended into heaven. He says, one day I'm coming back, right? So the most of Daniel is about the second coming when Jesus comes the second time. And he says, the book will be opened at the end of time. In other words, you will begin to understand things in Daniel when the time of the end begins to approach. Are y'all following that? So someone says, well, how do you know that that's now? Well, the next words say, many will go back and forth. Let me just pause right there real quick. Many will go back and forth. He's talking about travel. Okay, listen to me. You will be able to, listen, we have never lived in such a day as it is today. Within hours, we can get on a plane and be almost anywhere in the world. Okay, that prophecy about many will go here and there. They're going to go back and forth is being fulfilled as we speak. That is amazing. I want you just to think about it. That's the day in which we live. Okay, But if that's not enough, he says, and knowledge will increase. Okay, first of all, let me say something about knowledge. You can have knowledge and have zero wisdom. Okay, knowledge is increasing exponentially right now. 10 years ago, uh, 10 years ago, uh, you know, when you would have computers, I, I got my first computer, it was probably like 1992, something like that. It's when I got my first personal computer. There were people who had them before us. But I remember I got my first computer and that first computer that I had had a 100 megabyte hard drive. Woo! Blazing slow. And I remember, uh, I, I can't even remember, I think it was like Tiger Direct. There used to be this company called Tiger Direct. I don't even know if they're around anymore. And I remember purchasing my very first one gigabyte hard drive. One gigabyte. 
my phone has eight gigabytes now. And I remember thinking to myself, this, I have so much memory, I'll never use it all. Uh, today, I have a computer, a personal, a, and I'm talking about a laptop computer. I'm not, that old computer that I had was like that wide and like that tall. And then the screen was like that deep and about that small. I mean, it was crazy. Now I have a laptop in my office that has a two terabyte hard drive. And I've not gotten myself caught into the trap of saying, I'll never use all this space because the other day I was looking at it and I was just looking to see how much space I got left because it popped up and says, you, are, you know, all your resources are being used up. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. I went on there, I, all my documents, everything I've ever written, I've got in Dropbox and keep it in the cloud. And yet I'm still almost bumping my heads on two terabytes of information. Uh, so 10 years ago, uh, we would know that 10 years ago, when you would talk about how quick was knowledge or how fast were, was technology doubling, and they would say every year technology doubles. And I remember we'd talk about it, you know, next year we're going to have to have something new because it's going to be faster and better next year. Yeah, doubled in a year. Uh, so 10 years ago, doubled every year. Five years ago, we were doubling every six months. You want to know where we are right now? I saw a stat the other day. Right now, we are doubling every eight minutes. Did, I didn't say that wrong. It wasn't every eight days. Every eight minutes, we're doubling in technology. In other words, you buy it, eight minutes later, it's out of date. Just want you to get that, okay? That's how fast technology. Now, I'm just trying to say to you, knowledge is increasing in our world today. What are you trying to say? Because he goes on to say, he says, it will go back and forth. In other words, going to travel anywhere they want and knowledge will increase. He says, that's when the book's going to be opened. We're now in that day. We are living in the last days. Uh, so why is that important to know? Because the Bible tells us in these last days that troubling times are going to come. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 28 says, be on guard for yourselves, for all the flock. And he says, this is going to happen in the last days, among, um, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, Paul says, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. He says, sometime after my departure, you're going to start seeing savage wolves come into the church. Verse 30, and from among your own selves, men will arise, watch this, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Here's, here's what he's saying, that there's going to come a day that inside the church, people are going to speak perverse things to draw disciples. Bible says if, if he didn't tarry, even the very elect will be deceived. I, I want you to catch this because you need to know we're living in that day and time right now. Now, when we say perverse things, the first thing, word we think of is the word perverted. And when we think of perverted in our culture today, we think of sexual things. Okay, listen to me. It doesn't even have to be sexual things. It's perverse means to twist. It means to take the word of God and twist it to mean what you want it to say. Well, we're living in that day. I want you to get that. That's why everything we're giving you right now is so important that we dig into the word of God so that we don't get drawn away. It is the word that keeps us grounded. Please hear me about that. It is not what your philosophy is, what your thoughts are, what your belief system is. It is what God's belief system is. That's what we believe in, the word of God. Okay, one more verse. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13 says, but evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse. In other words, I just want you to know the day in which we live, it's going to get worse. And he says, watch this, deceiving and being deceived. I always, so many Christians will make the dumbest statement and they'll say, well, I can't be deceived. Okay. Listen to me. He's talking about among the believers. You have the potential of being deceived. Okay. Someone says, how do I avoid that? We stand on the principles of the word of God and not on what we think or what we feel. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, it's important we get that. 
So fine wine only happens as a result of us standing on truth, not standing on what we want. And by the way, the culture today is telling you, no, don't believe that. By the way, you think, it'll never happen, it'll never happen. Do you know in Canada right now, if you stand on biblical principles of sexuality and you teach that, you can now be fined up to $10,000 and spend five years in jail. And right from Canadian Parliament, the Bible is actually just a book of myths. Oh, it'll never happen here. In Finland right now, there's a woman who uh, is in there. I think it's parliament. I don't, Finland, whatever their uh, government structure is, but she is in there. Uh, They passed a law that basically says the exact same thing. Uh, She is on trial right now for things that she wrote on social media eight years ago for holding to biblical truths on marriage. And now she's facing up to two years in prison for what she's said. You say, well, it'll never happen in America. You better wake up. I want you to know it is coming and it's coming soon. And it's, it's important that you don't get deceived and taken away. Uh, I had a couple stand in my office a few years ago and, and the woman said to me, I said, it was a long story, but I said, you're deceived. And she said to me, she goes, I'm not deceived. If I were deceived, I'd know it. That's the definition of deception. (laughs) Okay, I want you to understand, you can't stand on, and by the way, her whole premise was what she had found on the internet. Because you know the internet never lies. (laughs) I mean, I'm just telling you, we stand not on what the internet says, we don't stand on what CNN says, no one does anymore, but anyway, (laughs) or Fox News or any of those, what we stand on is the word of God. That's what we stand on. It's important we get that. So we're talking about relationships. Let's get to the message. Are y'all think I'd never get there? Here we go. So hope you go to Genesis chapter one with me. And I've got one question. I, I actually, I was taking notes. Uh, I actually write things in my Bible. There's things I feel like God spoke to me about. And back in 2015, I wrote these notes down in my Bible. Okay, so that's how old. But I've never, I don't think I've ever preached this message before, but it's just things that I felt like God downloaded in my heart back in 2015. And so I wrote this question in my Bible that says, why did God create marriage? Okay, why did God create marriage and for what purpose is it involved? So I wrote down four things why God created marriage, okay? And I hope you'll write these notes down. So if you're taking notes, write this down. If you're not taking notes, write this down. Okay, so number one, to replicate God's nature and image. God gave us marriage to replicate his nature and his image. Okay, I wanna show it to you, Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our image. Likeness. Just pause right there. We're going to finish that in a minute, but just think about it. He, think about these words, us and our and our. What he's saying, okay, listen, he's not saying God the Father saying to the angels, let us. Okay, no. Remember, only God can create. Okay, create, listen, you can be creative because creative means taking something that exists and making something out of it. God made you creative. Aren't you glad for all the creative people? Wasn't a great new song we sang this morning. That comes from creative people, taking something and making something out of it. Being, Being able to create means to take nothing and make something out of it. None of us can do that, okay? So he's not talking to the angels, so who is the us and the our? Okay, think about this. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit He said to himself, let us go make man in our image. If you don't know this, marriage is the perfect image of the Godhead, the Trinity. Someone says, well, there's only two people in marriage. I know. But think about this. Successful marriages always have God right in the middle of things. So watch this. Perfect marriage. He says, husbands, love your wife even as Christ. Love the church. Uh, The husband is a picture of Jesus. The wife is the picture of the Holy Spirit, gentle, kind, tender. Y'all, I know not all wives are that way, but most <laughs> gentle, t- kind, tender. 
Do y'all see this? And then a marriage works when the father comes in and, and joins the son with his spirit. Do y'all see that? A good marriage is made up of a husband and a wife and God in the middle of it. What do you want God to direct our path? Y'all see that? Okay, watch this. He goes on to say, Genesis 1, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Okay, there are not 157 different kinds of genders. I might, and maybe this steps on your toes. Good. Because I need you to hear me. In the end, their perverse times will come. You need to hear this. And by the way, there are churches now teaching perverse things. God created them male and female. Okay, now why is that important? Remember, he created us in his image. What is happening today? What is happening in our culture? I need you to understand what is happening, okay? And it's real simple. I'm gonna put it in the most simple terms that I know how, okay? God created man or mankind. The word there is Adam or Adam, but the word Adam is, is actually referring to, to both male and female. It's mankind, okay? So God created man, how? In his own image. What's happening today? Man is creating God in their own image. That's what's happening today. I need you to understand that because God never intended it for relationships to say, we're gonna do it our way. We don't care what God says. We'll make God say what we want him to say. That makes you think that you're God. And just because you're in his image doesn't make you him. Do you understand that? And, and by the way, the image of God was a three in one. Think about this. One God, we don't have, we don't have three gods. We have one God, but he has three parts. Uh, you as a human being have three parts. Right, just think about my parts. Okay. So I am, uh, I am a, uh, I am a father. I am a husband and I am a pastor. I may not be your husband, but I'm Lisa's husband. I may not be your father, but I'm Anna and Michael's father, right? But I am your pastor. Okay, I want you to get that. God has three parts and three roles that he plays in your life. He plays the role of a father, a son, and his precious spirit who's his presence in your life. You need him. Y'all see that? We don't create God the way we want him. We, we accept God the way he is. And that's the reason why when Moses is standing at the burning bush, he says, who should I say sent me? He said, tell him I am sent you. <laughs> In other words, I am. I always was and I always will be. I am. I don't change. We try and change God. God says, don't change me. Because I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Are y'all with me on this? Okay. It's important we understand that because we need to replicate the image of God. By the way, someone says, well, that's Old Testament. All right, well, how about some New Testament verses? <laughs> Ephesians 4, 24 says, and put on the new self. In other words, someone says, well, you don't understand, pastor. Uh, I was born this way. I was, listen, you're right. Okay, listen to me. People are born sinners. People are born wicked. And some of you are saying, well, you're saying I'm wicked? Well, I was too. Okay, you were born that way, but listen to me, you must be born again. You have to put on the new self. God will change you. You must be born again. He says, and put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God has been, he says, which is in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness and of truth. When man was in the garden of Eden, before they fell, they were perfectly in the image of God. And God says, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Satan comes along and says, has God really said, begin to question what God said, twisted the word of God. Eve says, what? Well, it does look good. I think I'll have me a piece of that. She had some, went to eat Adam and says, well, I don't want to be the only one. How about you have some too? 
Adam didn't want to look like the fool and said, sure, and he ate. By the way, the Bible says through one man sin entered the world. He had the option at that moment to say no. Right? But he sinned and God says, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Someone says, well, they didn't die that day. They lived on. They sure did. But that day they didn't die physically, but they died spiritually. So they went from being a three in one that day to being a two in one. Oh, think about it just real quick. Think about this. Uh, they go and put fig leaves on themselves because they didn't know what else to do. Uh, God came and covered them with animal skins. Okay, if you hadn't thought about it, think about this. The very first sacrifice that was ever made was by God. And the very best sacrifice that was ever made was through his son, Jesus. Do y'all follow that? It's important we understand that. Okay, so he says, you can be born again. You can put on a new self. You don't have to keep acting like what you were. You can begin to act like the Lord. Put on the new self, be born again. James 3, 9 says, talking about the tongue. By the way, how many of you know the tongue's what gets us in trouble a lot? Uh, it's when we begin to say what we want to say about what, who we want to say and where we want to say, right? So he talks about the tongue. And in James chapter 3, verse 9, he says, with it, talking about the tongue, with it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men. Just think about that. Come on, how many of you have ever done that? Don't lie, because you, you need to be born again. Because we've all done that, right? We bless God, and then we, and then we cursed man. He says, that's what we do, who have been made in the likeness of God. You, you were made in God's likeness. And when you curse men, you're cursing the likeness of God. That's, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? He's telling you, you can, you can do things on your own and be wrong about it. So why did, why did God create marriage? It was so that we could replicate God's nature and image. Here's the second thing. So that we can extend God's kingdom and authority on earth. Genesis 1, look at again, Genesis 1, verse 26. Look at the second part of that. And I, I kind of, I reread it, but I kind of skipped over it. He, he said after he created man in his image, he says, uh, and God said, let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. He's telling you that God has established man and marriage on the earth so that they can have authority over the earth. God wants you to have his authority in your life. Let me say it another way. The word authority in the New Testament is the word exousia in Greek. It means the power of God. I want you to get that. God wants you to have his authority on earth. Genesis, uh, Matthew 28, verse 19 says, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me, therefore you can go. Why can you go? Because I'm with you. Do, do y'all see this? God says, I'm reestablishing my authority on earth. How can he do that? Well, a man must be born again. Jesus said to Nicodemus, the man says, what, how, how can I enter the kingdom of heaven? Jesus said, you must be born again. Nicodemus, how can I do that? Can I enter my mother's womb a second time? No, that which is born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You must be born, not you, ha you, you can. Well, there's, a, there's five or 10 different ways. No, you must be born again. And then when you're born again, Jesus says, I'm going to go with you. Therefore, you have my authority back in your life. You're going to go back from being a two back to a three again. If you'll live my way, that's what he's trying to tell us. And he says, yeah, I want you to rule over it. Verse 28 says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And here's the word, watch this word, subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Praise God. There's, there's no creature that gets to rule over us on earth. Where are my hunters today? I mean, come on, fishermen. I'm just telling you, we have authority over this planet. By the way, let me say something to you about that. 
I believe we ought to take care of this planet. I really do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a, uh, uh, crazy climate change person, but I will tell you, uh, it disturbs me greatly to watch people throw trash out their car. You're not taking authority over something. You're abusing something that's on. Okay. I just saying to you, it's always bothering me. My kids know that because I, man, you know, I can't now they're old enough that they have to do their own thing, but I would have beat them within an inch of their life. If I ever saw them throwing trash out of their car because we have a responsibility to this planet. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's move on. Someone like, let's move. Okay. I, I, I have something for everybody. Okay. So anyway, So why did God create, just think about this, God created marriage so that the two of you together under God's rule can have authority. Is that good? Here's the third thing. To generationally perpetuate the nature of God and the values of his kingdom. In other words, this is supposed meant to be from generation to generation to generation. This is something that should be passed down to pass down to pass down. And even if you do not have children, you have a generational responsibility that God has placed upon your life. Let me read this to you. Exodus chapter three, verse 15. I told you that was the second passage that I want you to turn to. Keep your place in Genesis one because we're gonna go right back there. But Gen- Exodus three, verse 15 says, God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, that's the word there is Yahweh. Uh, in Hebrew, it is yod Hey vav Hey. It is four consonants. No vowels, because they would not pronounce the name of God with vowels in it, because it was sacred to say the name of the Lord. So his name is Yahweh, uh, or Jehovah. Some people would say Jehovah. Uh, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Jehovah, Jehovah, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial name to all generations. All generations. Okay, just think about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God has a generational blessing upon people who follow his kingdom approach to life. Some of us are Abraham's. Some of us are Isaac's, some of us are Jacob's, and God says, I have a generational blessing for your life. This whole series, we're going to deal with generations through this whole series, and it's going to be a different kind of series than what you have ever seen before, what I've ever done before anyway. You may have seen it somewhere. I have never seen it done. We're we're going to, in the next five weeks, I'm going to have different generations on the platform and I'm going to interview them and we're going to talk about the things that they're faced with. Next week, we're going to talk about young singles and the things that they have to face in this world today and how do you overcome that. We're going to talk about that next week and we're going to go and we'll eventually make our way all the way to our silver, got to be careful here, I don't know, foxes, how about that? But every generation is important. I want you just to think about this. You're in one of those generations, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. If you are, by the way, if you're young, you're a child, you're gonna come into the generation. Uh, I'm talking about from teenagers and below. Eventually, you're gonna come into the generation of being Jacob. But right now, you should be being led by the Jacob generation. Jacob generation is about 20. In our terms today would be 20s and 30s. Where are my Jacobs today? Let me see your hands, 20s and 30s. Look at that, look at that, look at that. Hold them up, be proud, be proud to be Jacob. It's okay. Okay, uh, then where are my Isaacs? Isaacs are between 40 uh, and through, fit, through their 50s. So 20 year span there, 40s and 50s. Let me see your hands. Look at all the Isaacs in the room. And then we've got Abrahams and that's 60s till Jesus. How's that? <laughs> look at that. I just wanna challenge you, you have a responsibility. Listen to me, Jacobs, I remember when I was a teenager, I looked up to all the Jacobs. I remember thinking, I I, I sure hope I can be like Jacob one day. I didn't use the word Jacob, but I remember there were people in my life that I remember looking up to as a teenager thinking, watching their life, watching these young marrieds, watching these young singles, watching how they live their life, and I thought I wanna be like them one day. Listen to me, 
can the teenage generation look up to you and think to themselves, I'd sure like to be like Jacob one day, and are you setting a good example for them? I'm just telling you, there's a whole lot of Jacobs today that have gotten confused. You'll not get confused if you get into the word of God and make him first in your life. I just wanna challenge you with that. And by the way, Isaac, Isaac gets in that generation where you're starting your children to begin to leave. You're getting close to that empty nest and some of you are even into that empty nest and you're still Isaac. That's my generation, right? You're in the Isaac generation and you start thinking to yourself, well, I'm glad it's all over for me. No, sir, because there's a generation just below you that still needs your wisdom. Please hear me. And then Abraham, no such thing as retirement in God's economy. Just telling you. I remember my grandfather used to have a hat that said, retard id because <laughs> that was his retirement hat. Can't listen to me. You aren't done. You're not finished. As long as you have breath in your lungs, there's a generation below you that needs you. Listen, we Isaacs need our Abrahams who can still speak into our life and help us with the next step in our in phase of our life. Are y'all with me on this? So there's a generational blessing that God places upon your life. Here's number four. Number four to multiply God's human family with godly and righteous offspring. I want you just to get this. Genesis 1, 28 says, but God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Okay, listen, when, if you're Jacob, you have a responsibility to have kids. And by the way, trying's the best part. I'll, I'll pay for that later. At least they'll get me. <laughs> but doing it God's way and not your way. And God will bless you. Uh, one of my favorite verses of scripture, Psalm 127 says, by the way, Psalm 127 verse one, I know this passage this is a great passage. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. Amen. Okay, you need to get that. But verse three says, behold, Children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. <clears throat> Some of you are like, yeah, I got my reward. <laughs> but you gotta raise them right, Jacob. Gotta raise them, the Bible says, if you train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, they won't depart from it. Doesn't mean they won't have some bumps on the road and maybe even take some bad paths along the way, but if you'll train them in the way they should go, eventually they'll come back to it. Uh, he goes on, he says, it's a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. He, he says, children are like arrows. And by the way, you go out hunting, where are my hunters yet? You go out hunting, you don't, want, you don't take one arrow, you take a quiver full of them, right? He says, a man is blessed who has a quiver full of children. They will not be ashamed when they speak of their enemies in the, at the gate. In other words, one day your children are gonna speak about you and what it's probably gonna be is one day when they're Jacob, they're gonna say about Isaac, I sure do love my mom and dad. They were amazing, godly incredible influences in my life. And it hadn't, if it hadn't been for Isaac, mom and dad, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. They'll speak well of you in the gate. Is that, is that good? Okay. Uh, but here's what I want you to get. Again, talking about children, can we mess it up? And the answer to that is yes. And I don't, I don't want anyone to walk out of here feeling any guilt or shame. So I need you to listen very carefully. Okay. I want you to listen very carefully. If you'll listen to me, there's a blessing in what I'm about to tell you, okay? And I'm gonna warn you right now. We're gonna talk about divorce for just a second, okay? And I know there's quite a few of you who've been divorced. And by the way, God is a God of second chances. I'm grateful for that. You need to hear me about this though, okay? You need to understand why God hates divorce. You need to know why, okay? So watch this. He doesn't hate divorcees. He hates divorce. You need to know that. Okay, watch this. Malachi chapter two, verse 10 says, do we not all have one father? And the answer to that is yes. Again, we're talking about why God created marriage. Has not one God created us? It's God who did all this, right? Not man. 
Why then do we deal treacherously each against his brother so as to profane the covenant of our fathers? Okay, I want you to, if you're highlighting something, highlight that last part. Why do we deal treacherously against his brother? Why do we deal with each other treacherously? Why do we do that? Okay, drop down to verse 13. He says, this is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hands. Something you have done, God doesn't accept your sacrifice anymore. He doesn't accept your offerings to him anymore. And you feel all alone, where's God? Why won't God bless me anymore? Verse 14, yet you say, for what reason? Why is God doing this? Why do I have to sit there and weep and can't seem to get the blessing of God? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom, watch this words, you have dealt treacherously. Do you see those words? You dealt treacherously. Though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Listen to me, you've been divorced and you're remarried. Your wife now is the wife of your covenant, the one you have now. Listen, do not deal treacherously with one another. He goes on to say, verse 15, but not one has done so who has a remnant of the spirit. In other words, you were operating outside of what God had for you. And what did that one do while he was seeking godly offspring? In other words, this is what God's plan is for your life, that you would have godly offspring. Take heed then to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. Don't do it. Be careful. This is important. What you have is precious. It's a bottle of fine wine. And you don't take a bottle of fine wine and go around shaking it all the time. There's certain conditions that you have to place it under. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to say to you, well, I've been divorced and remarried and divorced and re listen to me. I, I always love, people do not want me to do your marriage counseling. I just want you to know because I'm pretty good about just saying you're the problem. And uh, listen to me, I've so far never found where only the man was the problem or only the woman was the problem. It's always both on some level where they deal treacherously with each other. They're shaking their bottle of wine around all the time. Listen to me. You're careful with it. You're gentle with it. You place it under the right conditions so that it has the opportunity to yield what you're looking for out of it. Are you, are you all with me on this? So he says, he goes on to say, verse 16, for I hate divorce. Please, please don't feel condemned. If you're, if you're divorced, don't feel condemned. God doesn't condemn us. He convicts us. Listen to me. He says, I hate divorce. I don't hate divorced people. I hate divorce. Why does God hate divorce? The God says the God of, of Israel and him who covers his garment with wrong. That's why he hates it, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously because he knows that divorce destroys lives. If you don't know that by now, if you're divorced and you don't know that by now, you need to wake up, smell the coffee. And this is not condemning, this is just simply saying, you have something that's precious. And if you, if you are divorced and you do remarry, the next time you marry, you, you deal gently, sweetly, kindly. It, it is a precious thing that God has given you. And it is the perfect picture of, the, of Christ. And if you're married now and you're, and, and you're considering it, listen to me, let, one of the problems in marriage is we deal treacherously in our marriage. Why not say, you know what? I've not dealt preciously with, the, with my spouse, kindly with my spouse, tenderly with my spouse. You know, in Ephesians, he talks about the church. He says to, to, the, to the Ephesian church in Revelation, he says to the Ephesian church, he says, you know what your problem is? I have something against you because you've left your first love. Go back and do what you did at the first Okay, let's think about this in marriage for a second. You know what happens in marriage? You know why you marry someone? Because he was so sweet. He was so kind. He held open every door for me. And then you get comfortable. Get your own door. I mean, it doesn't go that harsh, but that's really what happens over time. You begin to kind of grow apart because you stop doing what you did at the first. 
Uh, in the beginning, you were careful about every word you said because you knew if you said what was on your heart, you'd lose her. I'm only speaking from the guy's standpoint because that's the standpoint I understand, but I know it happens on both sides. And I'm saying to you, you gotta go back and be tender again, gentle again, careful again, cautious again, because what God has given you is precious and not meant to be dealt with treacherously. Is, is that a good word for us today? I, I hope that you, I pray, I pray that if you're here today, you don't leave going, well, that preacher. I hope you leave today and say, that was a good word. I haven't always done it this way and I haven't always seen it this way, but from this day forward, I want God to teach me. I want to know his word. I want his perfect plan for my life. And I'm not going to create a God in my image. I'm going to create my life around the image of God. That's what God's called us to. Can I pray for you today? Just ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. We always like to end with this little statement. What is God saying to you? What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? He's the precious part of the Godhead. So would you just say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Some of you need to repent. Repent means, listen to me, it doesn't mean being sorry. Repent means changing your thinking. That's what repentance means, change your thinking. Someone says, well, I need to change my heart. You can't change your heart. But if you'll change your thinking, God will change your heart. So some of you need to repent today. God, forgive me for how I've treated my mate. God, forgive me for thinking things and trying to create you in my image. God, today, I surrender my life back to you and I trust you. In just a moment, we're gonna have a team that's gonna be here at the front. If you need prayer for any reason, by the way, don't ever think, well, if I go, people are watching me. You know what people are doing? They're not watching you. They're thinking about themselves. So listen, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today about getting prayer, come for prayer. Don't be afraid, come for prayer. Prayer gives us the opportunity to put God back in the middle of things again. So if you need prayer today for any reason, doesn't matter what it is, it can be health, it can be marriage, it can be finances, you need prayer today. Maybe you're in depression right now. Come for prayer. I know a God who can put courage in. Depression is when courage gets taken out. So if you need prayer, I want you to come. Holy Spirit, we love you and we bless you in this place. I pray for every person in this room who makes a decision before you to follow you wholly, to choose your image over their own and to trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, let's stand in worship. If you need prayer, come on. We wanna pray for you.